Welcome to the 10th podcast of the Merseyside Pensioners Association, recorded on July the 2nd, 2020. It's not just for pensioners, but for everyone. In today's programme, we interview Liverpool City Councillor and Cabinet Member Barry Kushner about the crisis in local government finance. Sheila Coleman explains the meaning of solidarity. Actor, singer and playwright Teo Aluko becomes Paul Robeson. Pensioner Tony Rimmer tells us why he believes Black Lives Matter and remembers Tony Mulhern. And we have a guest appearance from Boris Johnson. Apparently, since he started playing his violin on this programme, pensioner Phil Newton has acquired a cult status in musical circles. I understand some of you just listened to the programme to hear Phil on his fiddle. This is pensioner Phil Maxwell saying stay with us because today Phil will not just be playing his fiddle but has got his cello out as well for another recital in his back garden. The extraordinary Black Lives Matter demonstrations throughout the UK have comprised mainly of younger people. These demonstrations have given many of us hope that the world can be changed by solidarity and collective action. The movement seems to be growing in strength internationally, proving that it's not just a moment, as Keir Starmer recently described it. There's a broader issue here, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, or moment if you like, internationally, is about reflecting something completely different and it's reflecting um, on what happened dreadfully in America just a few weeks ago um, and showing or acknowledging uh, that as a moment across the world and it, it's, it's a shame it's getting tangled up with these organisational issues um, with the organisation Black Lives Matter but I, don't, I wouldn't have any truck uh, with what uh, the organisation... We want change! We want change! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! A demonstration in Liverpool would not be complete without a contingent of Merseyside pensioners on the march. Earlier I caught up with former Labour councillor and current MPA member Tony Rimmer and asked him why he went to the recent Black Lives Matter demonstration in Liverpool. Well, as, as you know, it was in response to the killing of George Floyd over in America and um, the Black Lives Matter organised it, you know, quickly organised uh, marches and rallies through various cities and towns in the country. Right away, there was the, uh, the notice that we were going to have one in Liverpool. So I just felt it was a responsibility really to be there, to show support for our community, to show support for the working class, black and white and whatever. It was just important to be there and a privilege to be there, certainly a privilege to walk along with those people and make the statement that we did. We got uh, a report on the BBC which said that there were hundreds of people on the march. And I think the Liverpool Echo, when they reported it, said there were 7,000. Now, I would say there were at least 7,000. It, it was one of those memorable marches through the streets of Liverpool that we'll remember and look back on in years to come like the marches of the Liverpool 47 and the right to work marches and various things that we've had in the city. The reception that we got from the, uh, the band and everybody was quite happy, the sun was shining and we were there for a, a solemn occasion, but the mood was really good. 
and I took a couple of photographs and I scanned it across the plateau and put it together as a panoramic and uh, there were thousands there it wasn't the hundreds that the BBC said there were thousands there and they were all working class black and white Asian people from the city of Liverpool and Merseyside everybody was doing the socially distancing it all started off all very nice the stewards were asking people to keep the distance and people were wearing masks I think 99% of people wore masks or a scarf around their around their face and, and nose and it was interesting that you there were comrades that you were walking with who you didn't recognize and I actually took some photographs I got to the bottom of um, Hardman Street and I took a photograph back up the street trying to get the you know the, the enormity of the crowd coming down and some of the people actually coming round into Renshaw Street, I think it is. On that photograph was a, a girl from Bootle Labour Party. I didn't recognise her because she had a mask on. She didn't recognise me stood there taking the photographs. It's only when I shared the photographs afterwards, she said, Tony, that was me. <laughs> so it was really odd that you were walking with comrades and you didn't recognise them. <laughs> it gave me a thought, actually, that in, in relating it to other marches through the city, members of the 47 who would normally have, have been with them certainly you know the, the late Tony Mulhern a, a you know leading member of the Merseyside Pensioners Association who, who sadly we lost back in October and um, I'm sure I would have been walking along there with him and he'd have been with me uh, both wearing face masks of course I've said this to you before I've got a lot of friends who unfortunately it passed away as we get older and if I had one wish to bring any one of them back it would be Tony just for what he meant to me and to uh, everybody else all the other comrades <laughs> Well, we're here to give a very warm reception uh, to one of these fascist fringe groups, which once again uh, decided to target Liverpool to demonstrate their power and influence. Uh, what we've seen today is a massive counter demonstration of the labour movement, community organisations, various anti fascist groups, the Liverpool Together, the trade unions have came down and put on a magnificent show of opposition to anywhere the fascists raise their heads and attempt to defile the atmosphere in Liverpool. The message from Liverpool today, every time you raise your snouts, the Liverpool working class will mobilise and drive you out of the city and ultimately drive you into oblivion. The late and much missed Tony Mulhern on what was probably the last demonstration he attended. Succinctly there describing the anti-fascist action outside Moorfield Station in 2018. The ever perceptive campaigner Sheila Coleman pointed out at the recent virtual Justice for All Grieve rally that Black Lives Matter has a particular meaning for Liverpool in connection with the death in 2016 of Mazay Mohammed. The way that George Floyd was uh, murdered in America mirrors almost identically the death of a young man in Liverpool only the other year, Mazay Mohammed, who was killed similarly. A young man with mental health problems. How often have you heard that before in deaths in police custody? And yet there have been no prosecutions arising around how Mazay was killed. He was killed whilst in the custody of police. And so what I'm saying is it happens much nearer home. Um, it's why it's important to support as well is because those people on Black Lives Matters are being punished. Um, only in uh, Derry and Belfast the other week, the police, the PSNI, were char arresting and fining Black Lives Matters protesters who were socially distancing on the protests but are being fined. So we are being criminalised for supporting issues that are so pertinent to us all. Ken Loach has mentioned and, and referred to Keir Starmer, saying which side are you on? Very, very true. 
I know what side I'm on. Here in Liverpool, we have good, solid socialist activists who supported over several years the campaign for Jeremy Corbyn to be elected into office, now suspended against allegations of anti-Semitism. Well, I can say I personally know those four people and I, I would put my life on them. I would stand there and I will stand there and I will stand out. And the message is, even to those of us within organisations, within political parties, do not stand silently by while your comrades are being suffered and negatively labelled when all they have ever done is fight for equality, whether that be anti-apartheid or anything else. It's so important to support one another. Sheila Coleman there, spelling out the meaning of solidarity. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nigerian-born Teo Aluko is an actor, singer and playwright based in Liverpool, but known all over the world. He's a good friend of the Merseyside Pensioners Association and has attended a number of our meetings as a guest speaker. Or perhaps I should say as a guest singer. If you've heard his wide-ranging baritone voice, you will know that he has a jaw-dropping ability to entrance his audience. He describes himself as a 57-year-old Nigerian Brit, having arrived in the UK at the age of 16 to do A-levels. He originally trained and worked as an architect, but gave that up in 2008 to pursue acting professionally. We're going to hear now excerpts from his critically acclaimed play, Call Mr Robeson, based on the life of Paul Robeson, the famous African-American actor, singer and civil rights campaigner. Nobody knows the trouble I seen. Paul Robeson, I said. Paul Robeson. No, 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 no. R-O-B-E. They said that I had been struggling for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa and that that is meddling in the foreign affairs of the United States government. Now that's too bad because I'm going to have to continue to meddle. Because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country and I'm going to stay here and have a part of it just like you and no fascist-minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? Must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. She's seen all there is to see from the dawn of time. It's Mother Africa. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, but I, uh, can I have the house lights on, please? We have white people down here and Negro people up there. For this reason, I'm afraid I have to say that this concert is now over. Teo Aluko performing in his play Call Mr. Robeson and bringing black history to life. Robeson's life and the groundbreaking work of Teo Aluko 
resonates today more than ever. You can listen to all of the Merseyside Pensioners podcasts by going to the Merseyside Pensioners YouTube channel. There's also some films you can watch featuring the campaigning work of the MPA. You can also hear us each week on Liverpool Community Radio FM 106.7 or online. You can also find us on Anchor FM. Remember, if you have something to say, then contact me by email at maxwellphotouk at yahoo.co.uk. Jane Foxton writes from Paris and says, Can we hear more songs like Let's Change the World that we live in? Well, I can do better than that, Jane, because the singer on that track was Minnie Stacy, and she's just sent me another recording that she's made called Just Around the Corner. And here she is singing it just around the corner with her partner, Graham Casey. Just around the corner From the life you thought was yours There's a new dimension You can open doors If you only make a start on Things you thought you'd never do All those dreams you once set your heart on Maybe they'll come true Just around the corner Turning from this world of fear Heroines and heroes Show you where to steer They can guide you through your sorrows Let you see that in the end Keeping both your eyes on tomorrow Get you there, my friend And if you're still in doubt About the root of your mission Then give yourself a break To take a detour That's just around the corner Following your inner voice You can face the future You can make the choice Where you find that calm inspection Your desires have been displaced Turn that corner in the direction Life you thought was yours There's a new dimension You can open doors If you only make a start on Things you thought you'd never ever do All those dreams you once set your heart on All those dreams you once set your heart on All those dreams you once set your heart on Maybe they'll come true That was Minnie Stacy, accompanied by her partner, Graham Casey, just going around the corner. Well, you knew that what's happening in the country to the National Health Service, where there's massive underfunding, and it doesn't matter how many times this government are told, you cannot manage a service like this in the 21st century by persistently cutting funding. Social care is in crisis, and the reason why the National Health Service is under such pressure is because the social care funding has been cut. Local councils have had their funding cut. So it's not surprising you get elderly people backed up in hospitals because there's nowhere for them to go. That was pensioner Mary Harrison talking about the crisis in social care brought about by the lack of funding 
and investment in public services. Councillor Barry Kushner is a Liverpool City Council member with responsibility for children's and social care. Earlier this year, he came to the MPA to outline the council's budget. I caught up with him again last week to ask him about the financial crisis facing local authorities throughout the UK. So Barry, 150 local authorities have forecast a combined budget shortfall of at least £3.2 billion due to COVID-19. Liverpool has come up with a plan. Can you tell us about that? Um, well, I think the, the, the plan in Liverpool is to try and um, seek, well, is to seek some of the compensation for the money that we've laid out in good faith from the city, but uh, together with a whole range of other proposals to stimulate regeneration in the city. Um, so I think it's it's a, it's, you know, it's a multi-million pound submission that we're making to you know to government um and we'll see what you know what their response is going to be and maybe there's a you know there's talk about maybe you know there's all kinds of options that the government could use obviously the easy would be for them to borrow the money and give it to us um the other uh, is that they could buy our debt through quantitative easing and and with the money that we that we use to service debt that we've got we could divert into our revenue costs so there's a number of different options but at the moment it's very difficult to understand really what you know what the government position is okay so it's a very ambitious plan it's a 178 pages long and it aims to prevent a socio-economic crisis deeper than the 1980s recession with a multi-layered program which if delivered will create 25,600 jobs, provided an additional 12,000 construction jobs and more than 9,700 apprenticeships. But when this lands on Rishi Sunak's and Boris Johnson's desks, they're not going to go for it, are they? My instinct is that there will be money that will come through, but I'm not sure that it will come to the local authority. I think there's uh, it will go through the combined authority and the metro mayors. That's what my sort of instinct is, because, and this is an issue that we've never properly resolved in the country, even through the last Labour government, particularly, is that is the role of local government. And I think the, and I think the the central government actually seeing what local governments actually can do and putting faith in it. Is, is something that you know the government this government in particular doesn't really believe in it so it's hard to imagine that all of a sudden overnight they're gonna they're gonna have this um, epiphany and decide that they're, all of a sudden they're gonna start investing in in local councils so I think some of it some of money I think some things they'll have to do that but uh, other things I think I'm um, I'd be surprised if they were to to fund it all but it's you know but we've got to We've got to make the, I'm not, you know, we've got to make the case, and the case has got to be made as well by, uh, with local authorities up and down the country as well, because the you know, the governments have got to be, be, um, the case has got to be made absolutely clear what you know what they need to do, to get out of this. Well, this report certainly does make the case for what the city needs, but you will recall that earlier on in the year, Joe Anderson caused a bit of a stir. On the 31st of January, he was quoted in a local newspaper saying that he would refuse to implement any more government cuts after it was revealed that a fresh round of pain was planned for the city. Mayor Anderson went on to say, and I quote Barry, I realise that this will put us on a collision course with government, but we will have no choice. We will not shut down the services that this city needs. If the government wants to impose this, they will have to come here and try and do it themselves. But they will have a hell of a fight on their hands. End of quote. Do you support Mayor Anderson and what he said in January? Yeah, I do. And I think, um, I think, and I think the case 
now is i mean every, things are sort of slightly different and uh, and there's always politics at play with isn't there in these things but i think what what it means in at the moment with us and it's not and we're in a better we're not in well we're not in as bad a position as an awful lot of local authorities up and down the country including tory ones mm. but but what we have to look at is section 114 you know and if if we you know, if we get to a position where you know, we are incapable of being able to manage the budget in the way that uh, we can because of the COVID crisis and the promises that were made by this government and on top of cuts we're already having to make, then I think that's something that we have to seriously consider. And one of the things that that we're going to do is, is, bring in, is bringing auditors in to, to check our books so that the government can't say that we've been... Um, that we've been spending money um, lightly or in ridiculous things. We've been spending money in appropriately to meet what the need has been within the, within the city. You know, we we shouldn't have been buying PPE, for example, but we have bought PPE because there was a shortage, and the shortage was obviously at the door of the government because they weren't because of the the i mean so you i know you've covered this before in your program but obviously you know the way the total chaos and the distribution and the supply of ppe meant that as a council we had no choice but to do that and that was the, the right thing to do now whether we'll be paid back for that probably not but that was the right thing to do now, it's been revealed this week that Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson have instructed Whitehall departments to find 30% of cuts, and that includes health. Now, if they're prepared to do that to Whitehall departments, they're not going to give £1.4 billion to Liverpool over five years, are they? Now, Barry, I know you're a big fan of the dented shield policy, which means defending the city from the worst successes of Tory cuts. But isn't there a big hole now in that shield? When Joe talks about the government having a fight on their hands, how does that translate in political terms? Does it mean Labour councillors being stripped of their powers? Does it mean commissioners being brought in? Or does it mean Labour councillors going back to their communities and organising in their communities a fight back? Um, well, I think the, one of the, the plans that we had before uh, any of this hit us was to, was to organise um, a citywide campaign amongst all sectors, the trade unions, the community with councillors and, and, and all the different political affiliations to the party um, to, to be vocal in, in terms of uh, our fight back and what we're, what we're really saying. I mean, we got, um, and that was because, and that was given that we found, we got into a position financially where we could see our way through this year. Now, obviously, you know, the plans like in my department, the children's services, you haven't been, we haven't been able to implement them. So it's not just the additional cost because we haven't been able to discharge children from care and that costs us a lot of money. It's it's you know, we haven't been able to you know, implement some of the uh, the plans that that we have and they weren't really say cuts in my department. They're more savings through through the way we were going to work. <clears throat> but um, so I think it I think what it means in practical terms is that which happened in Northampton, you know, where you say, well, we're, we're no longer in a position where we can balance our budget. Um, then we we um, apply and go through a procedure for a 114, which I'm not very clear about myself, uh, 114. But that ultimately will mean that, you know, the commissioners or officers from the state will come in and they will make decisions about how the budget is going to be operated in in Liverpool, and to do that, <clears throat> and in response to that, you know, there has to be a massive political response. But I think, but I think what we're seeing now, as opposed to what it was before, um, is that this is a crisis of local government. This isn't just a crisis of Liverpool's local government. This is a national crisis of local government. And as I said before, I mean, I I, I met with all the um, my counterparts in the Northwest authorities, and they were this, and that was about five, six weeks ago. They were in a worse position than we were 
in terms of what they've been laying out. So we're not, it's bad for us, but we're not in a, as bad as even some of those are. So in terms of what the response is going to be, you know, the government has got an, an absolutely major headache on its hands, to be honest, because the whole institution of the state and public service and public services is currently under threat. Um, and I think there's going to be an awful lot of pressure on them to 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 address that. And, the, and at the moment, they you know they're doing one new turn after the other. So let's see what happens there. I mean, the other thing I was going to say, Phil, is they were talking about 30 percent, 20 percent cuts, departmental ones um, in December. So it's not it's not new. I mean, they're still, but they're, but obviously they're trying to to do to do that now. So I don't. I mean, I. I yeah, you know, not sure where they're going to find any. Do you think we are facing a much harder phase two austerity program? I think that the mindset. Well, if it happens and it comes, if they impose austerity, regardless of the severity of it, the impact of it, I think, will be greater than it was previously. Partly because council finances have bared down to the bone anyway, but also I think there's a different mindset, and I think that one of the it, the things that COVID nineteen crisis has shown us is that how important and reliant you know the country is. I'm talking about on essential workers. A lot of them are very low paid. Um, on our care on our care home staff again also uh, very low paid the impact of inequality on people's health and and ultimately their you know in some well in a lot of thousands of cases in terms of their death so these are things that people know people know that now they've seen it no one really can deny it and it's kind of in a in the mainstream which it wasn't 10 years ago so i think it just runs to bring in austerity now runs totally counter to what people's expectations are. Everyone, everyone's made a sacrifice. Everyone's made a sacrifice for this period. Uh, and some have suffered more than others, obviously. And I think when Lloyd George talked about making a country um, he didn't say fit for heroes in that, but, he, but the phrasing was the same, but about a country fit for heroes. Um, that's what that's what we need to do now. And I think that's what people expect. And even Johnson invoked the Second World War at the very start of this crisis. And I think that's that the response that the country expects is one that meets that need. You know, we don't want to, if you were to ask people in the country, I believe, regardless of their political persuasion, I think most people would say we don't want to continue running the country the way we've had it before. Something has to change. So it's a major political risk for the government, I think, to bring in uh, austerity because they haven't, th they can do it. They could, they've got a majority, they can do it, they can pass it, but it doesn't have the same support amongst the the media, even some economists, even um, other political commentators, even that, that last time were all in their pocket. Well, it's not going to be the media and economists who fight this, is it? It's going to be the working class of Liverpool. And I know, Barry, that if you take the gloves off to this pernicious Tory government, then the Merseyside Pensioners Association will be right behind you. In fact, we'll be standing next to you. Thanks there to Barry Kushner, and we'll be keeping an eye on the economic situation in local government, and uh, we'll keep you posted. I don't know about you, but during the lockdown, my mind has started to wander a bit and I've imagined some very strange situations. The other day, I imagined that Boris Johnson was a guest speaker at a Merseyside Pensioners Association meeting. And in advancing that plan now, 
I just serve notice that we will not be responding to this crisis with what people call austerity. We're not going to cheese pair our way out of trouble because the world has moved on since 2008. And we not only face a new and in some ways a far bigger challenge, and I can tell everybody, businesses, that next week the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will be setting out our immediate plan to support the economy through the, the first phase of the recovery. But this moment also gives us a much greater chance to be radical and to do things differently, to build back better and to build back bolder. And so we will be doubling down on our strategy. We will double down on levelling up, if you can make sense of that. Many pensioners struggle with poor housing, rising fuel costs and a basic state pension that is the worst in Europe. Pensioner poverty is increasing with two million pensioners living in poverty and one in three older people living in homes with inadequate heating or insulation, making their homes more difficult to heat or keep warm. In view of this, it's alarming to hear reports that the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is considering attacking the triple lock. Introduced in 2011, the lock guarantees that the basic state pension will rise by a minimum of either 2.5% or the rate of inflation or average earnings growth, whichever is greater. Rumour has it that the Tories plan to get rid of it or possibly freeze it for two years to help cover the cost of the COVID-19 pandemic. Scrapping the triple lock will cause hardship now for pensioners and for future generations. We will be watching this carefully and will keep you all posted about developments. In our next podcast, we will be talking to our NHS senior nurse practitioner who thinks that the ruling class has been practicing social distancing for centuries and will have an exclusive interview with Dave White and Vicky Cooper on why they think the government should be held to account for crimes against humanity. Thanks for your company today. This is Phil Maxwell saying, remember, you are not on your own. We are stronger together because we understand the meaning of solidarity. Until next time, stay safe. And I leave you with music from Merseyside pensioner, Phil Newton. Now, a classic um, Elstree Studios film of the 50s, I think, uh, The Lady Killers theme tune. A bunch of gang, uh, bank robbers plotted to rob a bank and <laughs> they rented a house in which to prepare the crime. Peter Sellers uh, leading a star-spangled cast <laughs> of character actors and uh, the la landlady, charming landlady, uh, loved music and she uh, fell for the plot that they put out that they were a string quintet. Uh, rehearsing for a concert with all their cases, cello, violin, etc. But they were for the money from the robbery. That was to contain the money to... And a classic film, so maybe somebody remember it. The Lady Killers. With apologies to uh, Boccherini.
it is on the fiddle in the correct key that Boccherini would have afforded, would have approved of. Boccherini. The birds seem to have gone quiet. <laughs> 